morning. It is Wednesday. When it's time past time for Bible study. I was sitting here working and I looked up at the clock and I was like, oh my gosh, I went past time for Bible study. I wanted to go see Mom and it's pouring down rain. I don't know if I want to get out in this rain. I've got to go though, y'all, because I've got to make something for supper and I don't have an onion or anything. And I was thinking about doing some potato salad. I might do it live. Anyway, let's talk about um, the, the Bible, the Word of God, right? Let me get to my place. We know that Jacob and Esau are grown, and Esau's a hunter, and Jacob is a soft gentleman. And um, Esau, all he did spend his time in the woods and being strong and big and mighty. And Jacob spent his time as a shepherd and studying in the tents with the wise men. And um, anyway, Jacob wanted the birthright of Esau from the very beginning. And God said that's the way it was going to be. And it was true. Um, he even tried to grab his heel when he was being born. And now he's looking for it the perfect chance to get Esau's birthright. So Esau comes in from hunting and he's all tired and he's weary and he sees Jacob eating some, they're calling it, they call it different things, pottage. And it's a type of soup and it probably didn't even have any meat in it. Um, but Esau was so hungry and so tired and he says he was close to death that he just really wanted some of that food. Now, it says his appetite was very strong, and poor Jacob had got some bread and pottage for his dinner, and it was sitting down to it contentedly enough, even without venison in it. And when Esau came in from hunting, hungry and weary, and perhaps he caught nothing, and now Jacob's pottage pleased him, his eye better than nothing. So um, he wanted his pottage. So it says, give me, he says, some of that red, that red as it is in the original. It suited his own color because Esau was, they say that Esau was red, um, looked red, you know, in color. Um, it says it suited his own color and in reproach for him for this he was ever afterwards called Edom which is red now it gives us a scripture and I want to make sure I'm not telling you all the wrong things so let me look at it because I didn't look at it this morning that's Genesis chapter 25 verse 25 let's see what it says It says, um, so the days were fulfilled for her to give birth. Indeed, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau, and afterwards his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel to his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So Esau was red and hairy. He must have been red-headed like me. So it says, he said, give me some of that red. That red is as it is in the original suited his own color. And in reproach to him for this, he was ever afterwards called Edom, which is red. Nay, it should seem he was so faint that he could not even feed himself, nor had he a servant at hand to help him. Bless his heart. But it treats his brother to feed him, okay? So he even wanted his brother to feed him. He was so tired. I don't even know how he got in the door, do y'all, if he was that tired. It says, note, and this is for us, okay? It says, those that addict themselves to sport 
weary themselves for very vanity. And that's in Habakkuk 2.13. They might do the most needful business and gain the greatest advantages with half of the pains they take and half of the perils they run into in pursuit of their foolish pleasures. Those that work with quietness are more constantly and comfortably provided for than those that hunt with noise. Bread is not always to the wise, but those that trust in the Lord and do good, verily they shall be fed, fed with daily bread, not as Esau, sometimes feasting and sometimes fainting. So he's just telling us that What it amounts to is that Esau was so addicted to hunting that he would stay out there because he wanted to be successful and win. He wanted to, he wanted to hunt. He wanted the game. He wanted to bring in that animal. And he was so addicted that if he didn't, he would stay out there so long until he fainted, until he couldn't go anymore. He was obsessed with it, y'all, which is goofy, you know. I mean, go out and hunt. Have a good day hunting. If you don't get anything, go the next day. Maybe you'll get something. But he was crazy addicted to it. And so they're letting us, uh, that's not good. It's not good to be obsessed with anything in our life, no matter what it is, unless we want to be obsessed with God, right? It says, the gratifying of sensual appetite is that which ruins thousands of precious souls. Surely Esau was hungry and faint. He might have got a meal's meat cheaper at the, expense of, at the expense of his birthright. But he was unaccountably fond of the color of his pottage and could not desire, deny himself the satisfaction of a mess of it. Whatever it cost him. Never better can come of it when men's heart, okay, let's see, it says never better can come of it when men's hearts walk after their eyes and when they serve their own bellies. Therefore, look not thou upon the wine or, as Esau, upon the pottage when it is red when it gives that color in the cup, in the dish which is most inviting. That made me feel guilty about food this morning, y'all. It says, because he's telling us, never, when, we, when our hearts walk after our eyes and we serve our own bellies, which means our own gratifications, our own wants, our own wishes. It don't necessarily mean our real belly. But our bellies are gut, you know, our gut. And we have a gut instinct. And we have our, the things that we really want, you know, um, long for. Are, that's part of our gut and our belly and all that good stuff. It all kind of goes together. So, um, we have to be careful and not... Uh, be obsessed with what we're doing and which I guess I was a little bit this morning but I am working because uh, I missed our Bible study time and uh, it says don't look upon the wine and upon the pottage in other words don't let your eyes um, want things that you don't even need you know be content and that goes for lusting after the flesh of a, of a man or a woman. It goes for material things that we see, that we think we've got to have, that we really don't even need. Um, and it goes for just putting our own wants ahead of the, the needs of our family or our husband or our children or our wife, you know, um, so we just have to be careful. It says that if we use ourselves to deny ourselves, we break the forces of most temptations. So we have to be the ones ourselves to say, 
no, Tammy, you really don't need that. Or don't look at that. Don't even look over there. Don't even think about it. Because if you start dwelling on it or thinking on it, then that's when the temptation starts, okay? So try not to. It says, his reasoning was very weak. Behold, I am at the point to die, he said. If he were, would nothing serve to keep him alive but his pottage? That's what I was thinking. I was thinking, how did he get in the house? Or how did he even get to Jacob if he was about to die? And he was so doggone tired he couldn't feed himself. I mean, he had to walk in the door some way. Um, it says, if, if the famine were now in the land, as Dr. Lightfoot conjectures, that's another man that studies the word. And Dr. Lightfoot, by the way, I had a Dr. Lightfoot that did my breast surgery and took off both of my breasts when I had my cancer. His name was Dr. Lightfoot. And he uh, did my double mastectomy and took out all my lymph nodes and I just love him because I know he scraped them all down good. And he told my brothers, he said, there ain't nothing left in there. And he's right, because here I am eight years later. I love Dr. Lightfoot. He's in Cobb County if you ever need a surgeon. Anyway, it says, we cannot suppose Isaac so poor or Rebecca so bad a housekeeper, but that he might have been supplied with food convenient in other ways. Of course he could have been. It says, and he could have saved his birthright, but his appetite has the mastery of him. He is in a longing condition. Nothing will please him but this red, this red pottage. And to help his desire, he pretends he is at the point to die. If it had been so, was it not better for him to die in honor than to live in disgrace and die under a blessing than to live under a curse? The birthright was typical of spiritual blessings and privileges, and those of the church of the firstborn. Esau was now tired how he would value them, and he shows himself sensible only of present grievous, grievances. So all he could think, think about it, y'all. All, all he could think about, because he's all into his self, all he could think about was getting that food into his body. So much so that he was willing to give up his birthright. He was about goofy. Um... And it, and it shows that he cared nothing about the birthright. It says, if we look on Esau's birthright as only a, as a temporal advantage, what he said had something of truth in it, namely that our worldly enjoyments, even those that we are most fond of, listen to this, y'all. If we look on Esau's birthright as only a temporal advantage, it says that if we, Look at our worldly enjoyments, even those that we are most fond of. Will stand us in no stead of a dying hour. They will not put by the stroke of death, nor ease the pains, nor remove the sting. So, all these things that we love so much, all these things that we concentrate on so much, all these material things that we seem to want to possess and think it's sentimental and it's so special. When it comes time, and we're on our deathbed, and a lot of y'all know this, you've had parents to die, you've had spouses to die, you've had children to die, you know that when you're on your deathbed, none of that matters. None of it. You don't even care about it. Now, some people are goofy enough to be fighting over things when somebody's passing away, just goofy, because it's just material things. But you know what I'm saying. If you're the one laying there dying, you could care less about how many books you got on the shelf or about how many trinkets you've got that you've collected. Or, uh, believe it or not, my granny was so concerned about her collard greens out in the garden. She really was when she was dying. But the majority of the time, even if you are concerned about it, it ain't going to help you none. I mean, they can't support you in your hour of death. So, um, it says, Yet Esau, who set up for a gentleman, should have had a greater and more noble spirit than to sell even such an honor so cheaply. 
But being of a spiritual nature, he, his undervaluing, it was the greatest profaneness imaginable. Note, it is folly to part with our interest in God and Christ and heaven for the riches, honors, and pleasures of the world as bad a bargain as his that sold a birthright for a dish of broth. So he's telling us that we are just as goofy and crazy to uh, part with our interest in Christ, God, and heaven for riches, honors, and pleasures of the world. That we're no different than he would be selling his birthright for a dish of broth. Repentance. Listen to this. Repentance. This is the end of it. Repentance was hidden from his eyes. He did not eat and drink. No, I'm sorry. He did eat and drink. Pleased his palate. Satisfied his cravings. Congratulated himself on the good meals meat he had had. And then carelessly rose up and went his way. Without any serious reflections upon the bargain he'd made or any show of regret, Thus Esau despised his birthright. He used no means at all to get the bargain revoked, made no appeal to his father about it, nor proposed to his brother to compound the matter. But the bargain which his necessity, which was his hunger, had made, and his subsequent neglect and contempt acknowledged a fine which is like he's guilty. He justified himself. Okay? So he was guilty of doing something really bad, really goofy, really stupid, really disrespectful to his family, to his father, to God, not even caring about his birthright, not even caring about the blessings of God's that was going to be bestowed upon him. And instead of repenting, he justified himself. Okay? So it says, no, for us, people are ruined. Not so much by doing what is amiss as by doing it and not repenting of it. Doing it and standing to it. Now, what that means is we're a lot worse off when we sin, know that we sin, and we don't repent of it, and then we actually make an excuse as to why we needed to, you know, it was okay for us to do the sin. Um, that's when it's bad because that's what Esau did. He knew what he was doing was wrong, but he didn't even care, and then he justified it. So when we make mistakes, look at my crazy hair. When we make mistakes, and we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to, we're going to mess up, and we're going to sin, but we should repent and let the Lord know we're sorry. Um, and I, I'm one, the Holy Spirit tells me pretty quick. You know, it tells me, you done opened your mouth and stuck it where it don't belong, or... Did you just hear yourself say that? Most of, the, most of the time, it's my mouth that gets me in trouble. More than, I'm telling you, my mouth gets me in trouble, and it has since I was a little bitty girl. My, I can remember my daddy telling me, that mouth's going to get you in trouble one day, girl. Well, it has, and it does, and it still does. It is my worst enemy. And um, anyway, I have to work on it, and I have to think about it, but I do repent. I do know when I do something wrong. Most of the time, I, the Holy Spirit helps me know. And I do ask God for forgiveness. And we all should, right? Doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means that we do acknowledge our sin. We should acknowledge what we do wrong. And we should repent. Okay? When you get saved, you go to heaven regardless. Um, because our sins are covered by the blood. But it doesn't give us free will to just do what we want. 
okay? Because God, we're a child of God. And if we decide we're going to get out and just rebel and just live like we want to because we're gonna, we've are gonna, we got a way to heaven, and which we do, you can't lose your salvation. Uh, we can't do anything to gain our salvation, so we, don't, we sure can't do anything to lose it. Um, but what happens is God don't bless us. And he chastises us and he punishes us. So we pay for it, regardless if we repent or not. So let's just t keep that in mind and um, try to understand, you know, when we're doing something wrong that we should, you know, ask for forgiveness. And we should tell people we're sorry too. Especially if we know we've wronged somebody or said something ugly. We should say we're sorry. Um... Let's say our prayers. I hope you're having a good Wednesday. I really want to go see Mama today. I really need to run to the grocery store. And hopefully you guys will see me coming on. I've got that chicken that I never did anything with, the rest of it. So I'll probably do some barbecue sandwiches tonight because I've got company coming over to look at this house. And I have not cleaned my house and I ain't going to. I just don't have time. I dust mopped a couple of days ago. Um, but anyway, I am going to try to do some potato salad to go with that bar and just have some barbecue sandwiches. So I might see y'all after a while on CBC doing some potato salad. And maybe I can have my hair fixed by then. Let's say our prayers. God is good. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for the rain, for our gardens and our flowers. And not everybody's getting rained, but here in Georgia we are, so I'm thanking you for it. We thank you for the friends that we have on Color Valley Chit Chat. May we all be a blessing and encouragement to each other. May we love each other um, unconditionally and know that none of us are perfect and we are going to make mistakes. Help us to be good wives, good mothers, good husbands, good fathers, and help us today shine your light wherever we may go, whether it's the grocery store or the drive through May we smile and at least show that you are in our heart and because you are in our heart, we can smile and be thankful and, and be good to people and not be ugly. Let's be good examples of Christ as we go about our day. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Bye y'all, thanks for watching. Colored Valley Chit Chat, Wednesday morning, Bible study. Love ya.